when COVID-19 hit us in the spring of 2020. The pandemic sent the world reeling. Forcing us to shut down economies. Forcing us to recalibrate our normal. Forcing us to confront the what's next. What's next for jobs. For education. For families. And our health and well-being. This podcast ponders how we will live in this COVID era. What's on the horizon? What should we expect? Where are the opportunities? We explore the what's next in In the the next next normal. normal. Welcome back to The Next Normal. I'm Aaron Trafford. I'm Dave Trafford. So today we are p- pulling another thread. We're, we're going to talk about our cities and our environment, our physical environment, and how we have been called to question it or reimagine it as a result of what we experienced in the pandemic. Yeah, I love that phrase, reimagine. Uh, the, the Board of Trade in Toronto had this report and this action plan that they were going to have to reimagine uh, our economy and very much in sort of in sync with what we're talking about. And I say that I like that phrase. It's because it's not as nuts and bolts. What The possibilities are endless if we apply imagination to what we want to do. So Dave Hardy is going to lead us on this conversation. He is the president of uh, Hardy Stevenson. And of course, they are urban planners. And Dave is also the executive director of the new suburbanism, uh, new, the Institute of New Suburbanism. And what they have really looked at is, you know, our failings in developing cities right now, but also how we have wasted the opportunities that are right in front of us. So, for example, many of us will look down our noses at the suburbs. And Dave's view is, and the new suburbanism view is, that it's an underutilized asset that we can help float all the boats better and higher. That we can create, you know, we can avoid the gaps that we see in our society right now. And really, to get at the whole question of a healthy city. And we forget that COVID-19 was really, first and foremost, a matter of public health. What role does urban planning play in that? Dave is going to tell you it plays a huge role. In fact, urban planning is a result of the need for public health years ago. That if we plan it properly, we're not spreading disease. I, I did not know that fact until he said it. And then, of course, it made perfect sense. But the other the other, you know, thread that we're going to pull here and that Dave is going to help us see and illuminate is that the concept of a healthy city also impacts things like food security, access to health care, um, access to, you know, in some cases, clean water. Um, there's so much that goes into this that is worthy of having, you know, a the conversation, but b asking the next questions. COVID has really pushed us to think about what healthy cities mean. Um, it, as planners, we look at the normal churning of, of cities, suburban areas, and rural areas. You know, people get born, they die, buildings get old, you invest in transit. That's just a normal part of life and city, living in cities, suburban, rural areas up until COVID. The COVID, I, I talk about two things. One is COVID has given a push and technology provides the pull. So COVID has shown us that um, healthy cities mean we have to come to grips with the health divide in the cities. Um, We pre-COVID thought healthy cities were were walkable. Now we're saying, well, hold on, we have hospitals that are over capacity. We have seniors homes that have been vastly neglected that have to be rethought. So COVID is, is, pushing us to think about that. It's also pushing us to think about where we're being pushed into a digital world. Our families are being pushed together. We have food and, and uh, insecurity that that has been eliminated or illuminated. Um, we need to fix health care. We, we have to pay much more attention to our low uh, income families and our newcomer families and so on. The, the technology push is uh, we can't miss this. Uh, and how it's going to influence in the future. Uh, agriculture products are grown in buildings. In fact, the most lucrative product in Canada is grown in a building and makes a lot of money for people. My food comes to me. Uh, cars no longer pollute. Uh, 
2030, we'll have 145 million electric vehicles on the face of the earth. The transit comes to me with, and now we have uh, in the fall a rollout of, of uh, AI vehicles coming to your home. I don't have to necessarily commute to earn a living. So all these things are happening uh, and it's totally disrupting the way we think about how we live how, in our communities, in our homes, our families, in our, our urban and suburban rural areas. Ushwal, when we talk about the safe, healthy city, uh, it occurs to me more and more, I've had to, con- you know, lots of conversations with the various food bank organizations, for example, across the country over the last 12, 15 months. Right. Poverty becomes, uh, first and foremost, I think one of the things that we're going to have to address if we're getting to the kind of things that Dave's talking about in terms of how we plan cities, taking that divide uh, into account. Yeah, I want to give you one example that's very related to this. If you look at the topic of food scarcity, a couple of years ago, most of the meanings around it, most of the conversation around it was pretty much uh, similar to the the excuses that large corporations, organizations usually give around it, right? Which is that these are locations that are not lucrative for us because too far to get to. It's very difficult to transport stuff. Uh, you know, they're, they're far away. The population is lower, blah, blah, blah. In 2021, the meanings around it have completely changed. Now the consumer looks at it as exactly that, an excuse, an excuse on part of governments, corporations uh, to not do enough to help lower income communities, which especially in the U.S. also happen to be racialized communities and to not give them access, not even give them a chance at a healthier lifestyle. And I think that's very much part of the healthy city conversation. And I think what's interesting about that is for the first time, the consumer is saying, I'm tired of relying on the government to do this stuff. So I'm asking the question to private entities, what are you going to do? How are you going to innovate? Now's the time. I- I wanted to pick up on the concept of poverty, too, because I think that, you know, in the past, we've linked poverty and financial poverty, uh, food scarcity. But we've seen through the pandemic that there's so many different definitions of poverty that have always existed. I mean, the digital poverty, for example, who has access to um, high speed wireless technology and who doesn't. So there's all different layers to poverty and things come out in really surprising ways. So more than a decade ago, I was on the board of an organization that was focused on healthy starts for children age zero to six. And they did an index, which they continue to do to this day, that looks at pockets within the Toronto area for all different types of poverty, educational poverty, physical activity. And what they found was that there were needs for interventions on some of these health and wellness related topics that were not necessarily in the neighborhoods that had the highest low income earners, but maybe, for example, children age zero to six that live within condo towers, maybe even very expensive condo towers, are seeing delays in physical development because they simply aren't getting out to parks enough because they're 23 stories up in a condo tower and they don't have easy access to be able to just go out in the backyard. So when we get to health and wellness, and when we look at what it means to build a healthy city, we really need to be looking across the board at many many different categories and really look at how do we build our cities so that they're good for the youngest members of our society, for the oldest members of our society, and for the most vulnerable. And if we think about those three categories, the rest starts to take care of itself, but we often ignore dimensions within those three categories. I think, Dave, you've got a really, really interesting role going forward. And I think that for planners, I think that we've we've had this experience, we've had this collective experience over the last uh, 15 or so months that's given us a new appreciation for what our community is and the people in our community. Um, I know that there have been a lot of um, people that were quite surprised that we had you know, in in communities in Toronto, in communities in Mississauga, where I live, that we actually have breakfast programs because kids go to school without being fed. 
And that's something that has stopped with the schools being closed. And that's been a surprise for people. I think that people are much more aware now of who's in their community and the fact that we've got a lot of people in our community that are helping us, looking after us, working in our grocery stores, delivering food, delivering all the stuff that people have been ordering. I think there's a new respect, but there's also a new recognition that the way that we've been living isn't sustainable and we need to build more integrated and um, resilient communities. Uh, yeah, I fully agree. Um, I, I, as you know, Dave mentioned, I'm a bit of a kind of out there in the planning profession, um, but I've been pushing for my whole career is that planning and architecture is more than buildings and or streets mm -hmm. or infrastructure. You've got to think about the people. In fact, one of the, the, the um, logos of our company is uh, a successful project is a successful people project, but we drill down even deeper on that, Sarah, to your point. Uh, we need to link social policy uh, probably as a priority to how we plan our cities and suburban and rural areas. And we just don't do that. It's just not in the culture of planning. It needs to be. And I'd say engineering and architecture as well. So the professions really need to understand what happens to people on the ground and, and what they can do to make lives better. And I know you're doing this too, Dave, but we also have to be building into our future planning. Um, we need to build in the environment and building in the opportunity to have um, people integrated with the natural world. Um, it's one of my passions and we're going to talk about it in a future show, but it's just so important that that's part of the experience for um, certainly for kids growing up. Absolutely. I, I, we are saying kids need to know how to go and see a frog. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dave, one thing I wanted to pick up on is something you said at the start of the episode about thinking uh, with a longer view in mind uh, as a planner. Uh, and I guess this is more of a question than a comment, uh, but you know, it's, it's fascinating to me because the, the challenges that we human beings face are, are more shorter term, at least that's how we tend to think. So, you know, if I am, if I am a family that, you know, is struggling to make ends meet and I'm, you know, between the, the two partners, we're working shift jobs, barely have time to, to manage uh, healthy eating, let alone taking the kids to the park, what have you, we want change now. Right. We want to see changes. Maybe we can think about the next couple of years, but we're not thinking 10 years out. Uh, and, you know, I think compa what's compounding uh, to, to the problem here is also the fact that urban development and I mean private urban development happens at a significantly faster pace. Uh, areas and cities get gentrified so quickly and um, suddenly they become un unaffordable, very difficult to survive within for older tenants, uh, older owners, and so on and so forth. So I'm just curious if if this is a conversation that that you guys tend to have a, a fair bit, because it, it kind of feels like if urban planning is looking at things 20 years out, but the human being is struggling with the next year, uh, how do we bridge that gap? Yes, and, and that's a, such an important point, Ujawal. Uh, I started my career as a community organizer, actually, and to your point, you start where people are at and deal with the needs that they're facing now first. And uh, we, we don't invest enough in our social programs or our economic supports. Uh, just had a, a couple of experiences just trying to get computers to, to uh, children of newcomers. It's so hard to do. What we talk about is ideally, and we, we need to shift to build complete communities so that you can be born, um, earn a living, uh, age successfully in these communities. And to Sarah's point, you can get access to a sustainable um, area. You can grow your own food. You can have entertainment. So what we need to really push is these complete communities that take care of those that are most in need provide jobs, but also take care of that full life cycle status. And, and we're still, as far as I'm concerned, in infancy and thinking about that. 
I think there's an interesting dynamic that plays out here, and it's on the level of what do we need policy and uh, you know long-term planners and thinking to address for our cities, and what do we need to take responsibility for for ourselves as people that live within the communities. So one example I just want to pick back up on that Sarah raised earlier is you know the ability for us, for example, to have our food delivered to us now and the convenience that that has provided some of us over the course of the pandemic which of course has created an entire new category of jobs within the gig economy, the freelance economy and precarious work for all of those people that are now delivering our food, but are not within formal structures and do not have formal kind of future career paths as the um, you know XYZ grocery store delivery person. For some, that flexibility has been really helpful, but our own choices and implications, we need to think about those a little bit, not necessarily even at the level that we make different choices, but that we're even aware that the choices that we're making are setting our city and our communities on a particular path. And one thing that I think the pandemic has done is it surfaced difficult conversations, or at least our willingness to have difficult conversations, our comfort, uh, and the way that we've navigated these last couple of months, we really need to decide, is that something sustainable that we want to take into the future? And what do we want to ask those that are in the position to set short-term policy and to put us back onto a more normal path? What do we want to ask of them so that things that have created imbalances, we don't just sustain because we've become used to them? I think that's a really important point that each of us needs to look at and say, well, well yeah, what is the implication of me never going to a grocery store and relying on grocery mm -hmm. delivery, for example. I want to raise another one because I think that's really, really important. And um, I want to do a shout out to all the grandmothers because I think, Dave, when you're planning for the future, you need to plan for grandmothers and the role of grandmothers and grandfathers too. But when Thank I you. look at, <laughs> well, grandfathers are really important too. But when I look at what's gone on in the past year, and I look at how incredibly important grandparents have been in supporting families um, going through the pandemic and supporting families um, that are trying, that have, you know, two people trying to work from home. Um, grandparents have stepped in and they've done homeschooling, they've done online schooling. Um, my sister, uh, retired from her job working for my company as a research analyst to look after my great niece, um, 12 hour days, five days a week. I mean, it's just incredible what grandparents have done. And yet I don't think we have our communities organized to support and enable um, seniors, um, as we found out. You know, one of the things that is was kind of shocking in my own community is we have, you know, apartments that, you know, are nearby where seniors live. Well, those people were not, not allowed to go in. The people that are helping people live independently were not allowed to go in. And people were isolated. Folks were isolated and for months. And that just can't happen again. We need better ways to integrate all of the members of our community together in a way that's more holistic and in a much healthier way, I think. Well, that's going to be front and center for governments right across this country, I think. And we will probably want to dig in on that a little bit more deeply because you, mm -hmm. you make, bring up a good point, Sarah. Dave, I just want to finish this se session off with, you know, we, we've talked about the long-term planning. And what we haven't touched on, and I just want your perspective in terms of the role it will play, is the smart city. Because so much of the delivery services and, and just the way we move and live in the city will be dictated by what we call the smart city. What, where do you see that going? Uh, certainly, there's a number of municipalities that are really doing leading edge work on smart cities. So to Sarah's point, if you're on a trail and you want to learn what that flora and fauna are, the smart city will uh, allow your app to tell you what you're seeing as you're walking along a trail. Um, we have streets that perhaps in the future won't have to be snow plowed because a smart city will have sensors and raise the temperature slightly on that street. Um, 
we have, uh, as people walk by community centers, they'll instantly know what programs are going recreational, maybe mom and taught, or even seniors programs are going on in that community. So it's a whole uh, area where um, I'm excited by and how it happens. It's going to take some resources and a lot of learning by everybody who's not kind of the, the leading edge tech nerd uh, about how this all works. But uh, it it promises efficiency, sustainability, raising incomes, dealing with health issues and so on. So there's a big, there's a lot of promise of smart cities if we, if we do it right. I just hope that it'll get to a point where the guys will know that it's garbage day at my house, that they'll come and take the garbage out for me. <laughs> That's what I want. That would be smart. All right, we'll leave that there. And uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope we are, you're enjoying these conversations because, um, you know, we're, again, not really trying to come up with big answers, but here are the big questions that we need to be prepared to face. And in some cases, they're going to be tough. Some cases, they're going to provide all kinds of opportunity. And some cases, they'll inspire innovation. So if you've got a thought on the show, feel free to leave us a comment, rate the show. And if you like it, subscribe. And pass it along. Share it to someone else that you might think uh, will enjoy the discussion we're having. So if I'm learning anything out of sitting in on these discussions for the next normal, is that we really need to be open, have our brains and minds open to all of these perspectives. Because what we had right there, just that discussion about healthy cities... It's not that there isn't just one answer. There are a lot of answers that contribute to the solution. And I think we, we sometimes we miss that. We're looking for a binary yes or no, right? And that they made it clear that to do this successfully, we got to have a great peripheral vision in terms of our opportunities here. Well, and also that it's, it's a not binary, yes or no, black or white, but also that that perspective is very, very different for one individual to the next. Like you may be sitting in a what feels like and experiencing a completely different community city than your neighbor just purely based on you know your demographics how healthy you are what kind of resources you need um i found that discussion extremely illuminating just even calling to attention the fact that we have to think short term and long term at the same time we that is what we have learned well, and Dave sort of touched on it too. That long-term, short-term thing gets into this whole question of uh, being adaptive, the questions of mm-hmm. being resilient, and th- those were that's really at the heart of planning that healthy city. So, if we've got the healthy city, it again gets back to the point where everybody benefits from the resilience perspective, um, and the things that we would think of as being contributing to resilience might surprise us. So um, so we're looking forward to it. That's where we're going to take it in the next conversation on The Next Normal. And uh, Sarah Thorne from Decision Partners will lead that. So we hope that, uh, that you'll sit in and join us for that. So it's always good to have you. Thanks for being here. The Next Normal is sponsored by Challenge Factory, shaping the future of work. By Decision Partners. Our world is a better place when we make better decisions. By Motive Base, decoding implicit meaning behind what people talk about. And by Hardy Stevenson and Associates, planning the cities of the future. Comments, questions, or ideas for our hosts? Feel free to drop us an email at hello at storystudionetwork.com. This series is produced for the Story Studio Network by Eye Contact Productions.